sometimes when you get together with other people in the business, you get to ask each other how it all started. And people do ask me, well, Harley, how is it possible that you got into designing loudspeakers and into hi-fi? What's the story there? And um, some of my customers or some of our customers have asked the same question. So I thought, well, I, I would share it with you. When I was about three years old, I might have been a little bit more, my father bought me a wind-up gramophone. You have to remember, this was uh, South East London in the very early 60s, late 50s, early 60s. There were lots of second-hand junk shops. And in those days, all these shellac, you know, the 78 records, nobody wanted them anymore because 45s had come in and LPs had come in. So nobody wanted them. You could get them almost for free. So my father bought me this big wind-up gramophone you know, with a handle that you had to sort of turn. And my brother, in fact, made me a, a little wooden step so I could stand up, so I could turn it with both hands. So I know I was, I was, I was certainly long before I was in school. And my father bought me lots of records, uh, mostly classical. You know, I remember I had a, a copy of the, the Brook Violin Concerto performed by... Um, so Yehudi Menuhin, well, he wasn't a sir then because he was only about 17, 18 when he recorded it, I think. But we had, you know, Bach, Brahms, Beethoven, even some more modern Mussorgsky, Stravinsky, um, you know, some of the Russian composers. But my all-time favourite at that age was Mozart's Eine Kleine Nacht music. And it was fantastic, you know, it was just wonderful. And when it got really going, you know, I could open the doors at the front and the big horn underneath would blast out through the house. Um, I'm sure my parents and brothers must have loved it on a Sunday morning. And then every so often you had to get up and wind up the gramophone again. And I was fascinated with this fact that you had this big horn that someone would sing in or an orchestra would play in front of and the air would go, the sound would go down the horn right the way through to the little end and to a little mica plate where there was a little needle and that would cut a groove in the wax record. And when the wax went hard and then copied it onto Shalak, these 78 plates, you, you wound up the gramophones, got the thing revolving round, put the needle back on. The needle vibrated because it was in the groove. It made the... Sh the, the the front of the, the, the sound piece vibrate. And then that used to then vibrate, send the sound all the way back up the horn and out of the horn. And now in my case, the horn was um, in the cabinet underneath and that created the sound. And it was so simple, it was fascinating, it was amazing. And I was fixated by it. And, but more than the technology was the passion for the music. I was just taken to another world. I was a dreamer anyway, still am. And Mozart and Brahms and Beethoven and, and Debussy, I had some early Debussy pieces. Just, it was a fascinating world. It was like an insight to something that I just couldn't believe, to be honest with you. So there was a kind of link between the technology of how it worked and, yeah, and, 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 and this amazing experience of listening to music. And then when I was a bit older, and I, I probably might have been just starting at school around the age of five, one of my great aunts had to go into a, an old people's home and she had a, an old valve radio, a white Bakelite radio. And I don't know, I must have been quite presumptuous. I asked my father if he could ask her if I could have it, if she needed it and she didn't need it and it was in a box and anyway. So, so I got it and I, I brought it home. And my father installed it next to my bed, you know, like on a little bedside table. And at night time, I'd climb into bed and then I'd turn the, the knob on and you used to go click. I can remember the feel and the click of the knob. And that's always been important to me in hi-fi equipment, good on and off switches. And I remember the, the click and eventually the, the dial would light up and it would start to glow and then you'd hear this hum. And then eventually you'd hear and then you'd turn the little middle dial and then you'd tune in on something which was being broadcast from goodness knows where. And then there'd be a sound of someone speaking, you know, through all this mystery. And then music would play. It was fantastic. And just sometimes I would turn the lights off, you know, because obviously it was nighttime. And I would I'd turn the lights off in the bedroom and you'd turn the, the radio around and you'd look in the back. And there would be these glowing valves 
And I had no idea how that worked. You know, there was no explanation about radio waves or anything at that age that would work for me. And I just couldn't work out where the little people were who made all those sounds. They must have been somewhere in those, in those glowing valves. Well, I do remember that sadly uh, one day I woke up and it didn't work anymore. Because what used to happen was I used to fall asleep with the radio on and my father used to come in at night time before he went to bed and then obviously all my mother did, I don't know, and switch it off. And obviously that night they'd forgotten and by the morning it had overheated. And it never did get repaired. And so a few years later, I, because apparently it was too expensive or whatever, so I started to take it apart and I just unscrewed the back and then I started taking the components out and the dials out and worked out how the dial worked and there was a little cord with a spring on it and how it t tensioned it and tuned in and you saw these, you know, the, the variable capacitance moving and then, oh, it's wonderful. And I started to learn about how radios worked and collected all the different types of tubes and I had boxes with all the different tubes because I used to then go to radio shops and ask them if they had any broken radios. I'd take my baby brother's pushchair and uh, I would bring them back. Uh, so I must have been about seven or eight by then. And then I'd start taking the loudspeaker units out of them and putting them into boxes and trying to make them sound better. And I remember I had this trick of, di uh, of cutting a, a triangle. My older brother used to help me with a wood shop because the great thing was in our house in southeast London, in the cellar, my father had a complete woodworking shop. It was like his hobby. So yeah, he was always working. So I used to go down there with my older brother and we used to get the saws and the chisels and the screwdrivers out. And we used to make all these things together. It was great fun. And I learned about making a triangle and putting a loudspeaker in the middle of a triangle. And then I could then push them up into the corner of a room. Uh, I couldn't do it here, could I? Because I have, oh yes, at the top there I could. And, and that's, you know, we used to make these different loudspeaker configurations. Anyway, by the age of nine, I had to go to a new primary school because my parents weren't happy with the one I was at. I wasn't developing fast enough, I think. I was always dreaming about things and not focusing on my work. And this was in another town. And to get there, I remember I used to walk past a factory. And in the summer, the gates used to be open. There were big gates. And sometimes the men would be working outside in the courtyard. And I could see that they were making big cabinets and they looked like they had holes in them for loudspeakers. So I couldn't resist it. So I, one day I walked in there and I know I wasn't more than nine years old. And I asked them, you know, what are you doing? And they said, oh, we're making loudspeakers. Well, it turned out to be the Lowther loudspeaker factory. And these guys indeed were making big, large cabinets with folded horns and different horn constructions. And they were putting their loudspeakers into them. And I made the connection with my old 78 record player of putting a speaker on front of a horn to create more deeper bass. So I thought, oh, that's clever. And then one day I went back in there. I was always going in there and asking them questions. Well, I must have been driving them mad, but they were very patient with me. And I went in there one day and I saw some ladies working in another room and they looked like they had small sewing machines, but they weren't sewing machines. They, they were actually little wheels and they were winding voice coils. They said they were voice coils. I thought, what a wonderful name, a voice coil, a coil that makes a sound. And what they were doing, they had this silver wire and they were turning a handle and they were very carefully counting the number of turns for exactly the right number of, of, of winds on the coil. And I believe that Lowther are still making their drive units today and they're still using the silver wire and they're probably using the same machines, to be honest with you. But I was completely entranced by this. And so I started pulling loudspeakers apart and looking at the voice coils and the wire. And I realized that the, the voice coil of a loudspeaker drive unit was extremely important because I also realized that the, the needle and the cartridge on a record player was extremely important. And that's the point where the magnetism is is, and, the, and the wire is moving together, so it's like a generator, if you like, so the electricity is coming into the loudspeaker, it's, and it's going into the little voice coil, and because the voice coil is sitting inside that magnetic field, it's making it move, you know, look up Maxwell's law and you'll understand it in Faraday, and it makes the voice coil move in and out, and I realized that the number of turns or the type of wire, silver or copper or whatever, was really critical, and that stood me in very good place, 40 years later, in fact. So there we go. So there's this young boy growing up and then I realized I want to develop my loudspeakers better. I want to get into a higher level. 
And just as luck would have it, my uncle Terry became an interim manager working at KEF, KEF Loudspeakers, which weren't very far from our house. And he got to know Raymond Cook very well. In fact, he, Raymond Cook became a family friend, not so much in our family, but in, with my cousins and uh, obviously uncle and aunt. And I remember asking Uncle Terry if he could put me in touch with Kef. I mean, I was still not even uh, 11 years old at this stage because I wanted to learn more about loudspeakers and, and start to build more. I was building them already. And yeah, sure enough, one day I got this lovely letter. I wish I still had it. Um, from Raymond Cook himself saying, Dear Harley, your uncle's told me that you're interested in building loudspeakers. Well, here are some plans uh, of all of our designs and draw uh, of all of our loudspeakers. And sure, there was the Kef Concerto. <laughs> there was the, it wasn't the LS35A. I didn't have that one. But you know, it was the, the equivalent, um, but with a simpler crossover unit. And there was the, you know, the, all the data sheets for the T27, the B110, the B200, the B139. And of course, with my pocket money or however, and by hook and by crook, I started getting my hands on these drive units. And I started building loudspeakers, more sophisticated ones. And then I needed bigger amplifiers. And so then I had to sort of go and beg, borrow and steal and get my amplifiers fixed because these, these guys needed more power than my lightweight paper cones that I was using. They were using a kind of Beckstreet, if I remember correctly. Anyway, so this was developing and then Let's sort of move forward until my kind of early 20s. And by then, my younger brother was now in senior school and at college. And he was really clever. I mean, he was really good at the stuff that I wasn't good at. He was really good at the mathematics. And we bought an old ex-army oscilloscope and, and, and test equipment and we really started working on some very, very serious designs and designing all our crossovers completely, of course, no longer relying on the Butterworth ones you bought on a mail order or whatever. We were really doing it in a serious way. And we set out to make a loudspeaker that sounded better than anything on the market. And what I'd learned was that the edge diffraction was really becoming an issue and it was recognized in the LS35A of nearly a decade earlier by putting the felt around the, the tweeter and everything. And so I thought, well, the secret has got to be to make the speakers narrow. But in those days, believe it or not, all speakers were sort of were width. I think it was all about showing off how big something was. So they had a lot of width, not so much depth to make the thing look big. So what my brother Damien and I did was we made the, the cabinet as narrow as possible so that we just made it just the width of the B110 units and we had one on top of the other with a, with a, with a T27 in the, in the middle and later on we replaced that with a Audax and later with a Morel. Um, and we made a cabinet like that and we actually got a very good result. The problem was though that, um, yeah, there was still too much boxiness. I mean, this is this, this whole thing about having a a pliable sides and a boxy sides and correcting that in other ways, especially in crossovers, or making the cabinet rigid. So we decided to make it rigid and we kept making it more and more rigid. But as we made it more rigid, it got wider. And that was then defeating our object. And then suddenly, I don't know who it was, it was either Damien or me, had a brainwave and we made two very thin cabinets, but we poured liquid concrete between the two with pins and it all locked together into one solid lump. It was enormously heavy, so we had to use a sort of scaffolding poles for our stands. But we made basically a stand mount long before they were really becoming popular. Uh, Lynn had the can out at that time, and we were really appalled by the, the sound of the can and that people were spending so much money on a Lynn Sondek and all that lot. And they were put buying these tiny cans and putting them in big rooms, and it just wasn't working for us anyway. So uh, we had this speaker, but we realized we needed more and more power. And luckily, MOSFETs were coming on the market. So my brother started experimenting with MOSFETs and then eventually by building active crossover filters, because our crossovers are getting so complicated. There were so many components. You know, when we tried to commercialize the idea, there were so many components and the construction was so complex and so labor intensive it could never have flown commercially. I mean, today it probably would in the high end. And, you know, I'm even sometimes thinking, well, maybe I should bring this thing back to life. And maybe it wasn't as good as I remember it, but it, you know, it certainly worked. 
So we got this thing to the pinnacle. And then a strange, uh, by a strange certain series of circumstances, I moved to Belgium. And there I was living in a, in, in, a, in a house in Belgium and I hadn't got any of the concrete speakers. My, my brother had taken them with him to, to, um, to Bristol at the time. And I thought, well, it's time to rebuild a new speaker. And then it kind of then, I guess because I was homesick a little bit and I was missing sort of uh, remembering my childhood and, you know, missing my family. I, I was thought about the Lowther days and I thought about this single drive cone on top of a cone of a cabinet on a horn. I, but I remembered that the single drive cone just didn't sound good. I mean, there was a little bit shouty, you know, and it was all a bit, and it wasn't quite what I wanted. It wasn't perfect. My dream from those days of looking into that little valve radio was to create a system where it sounded exactly like the musicians were playing for me in my living room. And I knew what musicians sounded like because from the age of 11, I was in a youth orchestra playing the viola and I was playing the piano and learning the guitar and singing in the choir. So I really knew what instruments sounded like and I knew that what I was listening to through the speakers wasn't like it was in reality. And so, yeah, with the, with the drive cone, the single drive cone, I thought I've got to somehow get that into a rigid cabinet and find a way that there is no coloration from the cabinet. And I started working on this and the first attempts weren't that successful and I was using a, a, a six and a quarter inch paper cone from Audax. But of course it couldn't go anywhere nearly above like 12,000 hertz and that's not enough. You want all those harmonics when, when the cymbal or, or the piano notes are playing and the sustain pedals down, you've got a whole beautiful array of harmonics that you want to hear that it just wasn't capturing. So obviously I was working again with um, Audax tweeters right close to the drive cone on a very narrow cabinet. And I realized by using four micro on the outside of the cabinet, I could get some of this resonance down, but I didn't want to make it wide for the same reason I didn't want edge diffraction. So I was getting there and I had a pretty good result, but it wasn't where I wanted it to be. And I really wanted to have a direct connection from the voice coil to the back of the amplifier. It was like a an Everest mountain appearing in my head and this vision of making the perfect loudspeaker with no internal components. So you just get the full dynamics and no diffraction or, dis or distortion between the different drive units because you've got the, the mid-range coming to you like that and then you've got the tweeter in a dome form coming out, pushing the, the waves out, like dropping a pedal ball into a pond. And then sometimes the bass unit is, is more or less flat and that's less relevant because it's, the frequencies are lower. So yeah, it was all this thing, this concept of a wires coming from the back of the amplifier and then going into a circuit board and then being split into three different ranges or whatever. Yeah, I, I just didn't like the idea. And then two amazing coincidences happened. The first thing was I was in the consulting business and I had a client who made stairs and windows and doors and he was making a lot of very high quality pieces in oak and beech. And I saw these nice big thick sheets, you know, like three, three centimetres, three and a half centimetres thick. And I was thinking, oh, this would be nice. And then at the same time, I discovered, thanks to the internet, um, a company called Mark Audio. And they were making these little cones, which turns out to be these, but the small ones. And there was a design by a guy called Scott Lindgren, who I later got to know, a really wonderful chap and a great designer. He's one of those people who's doing really great designs, but they're kind of behind the scenes. You, you don't really know about him so much as some of the other more f famous people, but a really great designer. And there was a, a designer, it was called the Frugal Horn. That's right, the Frugal Horn. And it was like a narrow, very narrow, with a little drive unit on a, it's not a, an exponential V-horn, but it's in a, a horn-type enclosure, rear-loaded. So you ideally had to pay, put it in the corner of the room. And I built this thing, and I got the, 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 the factory. My client asked them if they could make it for me. And they did a beautiful job. And actually, they sounded really good. And the owner of, the, uh, of our production unit today um, still, still has a pair, I believe, in, in his living room. 
And they sounded really, really good, but they weren't perfect. And then I remember a design I made, the design with the paper cone back in 95 and the tweeter. And I thought, that's it. I'm going to apply this cabinet design, but using three centimeter thick, 3.3 centimeter thick, solid oak, high density oak. And I'm going to find the drive unit. And then I reached out to Mark Fenlon and a whole series of phone calls to him in Hong Kong and back and um, sending products and sending and other products. And then, and then it, we, I got it quite a long way. It took a while for, the, for our factory to really get to the quality of construction that I wanted because they, obviously the, the demands of a loudspeaker cabinet are very different from, from, from stairs or whatever. And of course, I'm really were looking for getting that cabinet tuned. And so I was tuning it like you would tune an organ pipe with, with pegs of, of, of wood and blocks and tapping them in and just getting it right. I was really using it and designing and building and thinking of it very much like one of my guitars or a double bass or a cello. I just wanted to get it tuned perfectly so that there was no frequency in the lower range anywhere where it suddenly boomed because of the cabinet. And ported cabinets, that's always happening. So I wanted this low Q and then the resonant frequency in the right place and get this box tuned. And to be honest with you, it took a few years and lots and lots of iterations to get it right. And typically, I think a commercial loudspeaker company would have just given up because it was the costs would have, were very high. Um, but still, I, I kept going. And eventually we got it just right. And we were just about to go into production when Mark Fenlon calls me and he says, Harley, I've got great news. We've, we've got a new drive cone. It's going to be fantastic for your, for, for your cabinet. And so he sent them over and it was a disaster. I mean, it was a lovely drive cone, but it just did not work. And it was just too much in the, in, in the upper mid. And it was that little bit of shoutiness and there's a little bit more brilliance in it, which is actually something which I know is very popular in the Asian market. But it wasn't working for me because it didn't sound like the instruments I was trying to reproduce. And that was a problem because the one, the drive unit he was making had gone out of production. So basically then we, we, we put our heads together, not physically because he was in Hong Kong and I was uh, in Belgium. And then he decided, OK, come on, we'll make that court drive unit just for you if you order a certain amount. And I was telling him about the ladies hand winding the silver coil. And he said, you know, what? I've got this idea of a certain kind of copper that we could use in a certain format and shape. And I said, well, let's give it a try. And so he did that and he made some units, sent them over. Amazing. Brilliant. So then I placed my order. And today the, the drive units have come back and, um, you know, they are made for us. And, it, you know, that's the story, basically, of how the Sibelius loudspeaker came about. And then the next part of the story, which is very important, is the fact that my daughter uh, was living in London. She bought an apartment and she was in a job where she wasn't really getting any satisfaction. And she said to me that, Dad, you know, I'd like to do an MBA. But I can't afford it because I've got I've just bought this apartment and it's expensive and I can't afford an MBA. To do it and I said well indeed it is very expensive and I wasn't really in the position where I wanted to fund you know a mortgage and an MBA or anything like that but, you know that's just too much of a burden when she's already had her university debt so I said well I've got this loudspeaker design it's sitting around I'm looking for a company and a people now to manufacture it and put it into production why don't you do it you know part-time with your other job because you will learn about logistics and supply chain and manufacturing and, 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 and stock and tax and, and everything, insurance and liability. You know, you'll learn everything, which is, you know, like a real MBA. And I will coach you through it with some of my colleagues um, from my consulting company. And that's exactly what we did. And that's how Pearl Acoustics came about. I think it was her name, uh, her idea. And she built the first website and she got all the marketing strategies. And she you know, was very good in sales. So she really understood that approach. And that's how it really got started. And um, that's where we are today. And so recently we've been investing more in our, our marketing and our stories. And gradually we've grown and become well known through our customers. But there's a little bit of the story, a twist I'd like to share with you, which no one knows about, is that when my young brother and I were designing these really sophisticated um, 
Kef based, should we say, loudspeakers. At that time, there were two critics. There was one called Martin Columns, and he wrote very technical reviews. And I, he was also involved in loudspeaker design. And he, there was lots of publications with Martin Columns' designs. And then my brother and I would scratch our heads and look, oh, but if Martin says this is the way to do it, this is the way we should do it. And then, and then my brother would say, oh, to hell with Martin. Let's do it our way. You know, it, but he was really the guru that we, 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 we followed. And I remember there was a Lentech speaker. And, and that was the thing we were trying to get. But there was also another one person called Paul Messenger. And Paul's reviews, I used to love because it was all about the music and you could hear his passion and his heart about... It was just like, you know, the two different people were so different. And the wonderful thing was our sales guy had set up a, a stand at a hi-fi show. I think it was in Bristol in the UK a few years ago. And uh, he phoned me, Paul Thomas, he phoned me, he said, Harley, he said, um, you never guess who came to our stand today. And I said, who? He said, Paul Messenger. I said, Paul Messenger? You mean the Paul Messenger? He said, yeah, he came. He said he loved it. He loved the, the sound. He loved them. So he said, if you send him a pair, uh, you know, I'm sure he'd like to do a review. Well, I, I don't know quite what happened, but the pair didn't go off to him straight away. And the pair went off to Alan Sercom, who's somebody else I really, really admire too, and um, at Hi-Fi Plus. And he wrote a lovely review on our loudspeakers. And if you read between the lines, he was completely in tune with what I was trying to do. He said, I can't remember exactly the words, but he said something basically that the Sibelius loudspeaker is a, is a, a speaker for people who finally found what they're looking for and are at the end of the exploratory journey. And I thought, well, that's exactly, <laughs> it's exactly how I felt. Uh, and all that pain and all those years of hitting my fingers with hammers and chisels and, and the pain of designing something and it not working and then finally getting there with the help of some very clever people and passionate people. Anyway, later on, I got a pair to Paul Messenger. And you know what? I, I sent them to him and I heard nothing. And it went on week after week after week. I think about seven or eight weeks had gone by. I just couldn't resist it anymore. And I said to Paul, you know, I don't want to chase you or anything, because for me, it's Mr. Messenger. You know, I mean, this is God. This is for Hi-Fi Critic, which ironically he was putting together with uh, Martin Collins. I don't want to put pressure on you, but what's the problem? He said, well, Harley, you know what? I just love these speakers. And... Um, I just listen to them all the time. They're just lovely. They're just, it's just what a loudspeaker should be. They're just effortless. I said, are you kidding? He said, no, no, they're great. So he wrote this review and he compared them to a pair of speakers costing 150,000 euros. These huge tannoys. And in his room, you know, the bass extension wasn't quite right. But I also realized that the pair that he had had come straight from a show and they weren't really running it optimum. Anyway, there came the time that I had to come and collect them from them because, you know, my daughter's running the business. And she said, look, you know, we've got, we've got these thousands of euros tied up in that pair and they should go off to another show. Uh, we want to take them up to, to up north. So I took the liberty to go over to his house personally and met his wife, a lovely couple. And we had a long, long chat and uh, I got them back. And then it must have been four or five months later, I get a phone call out of the blue and it says, Harley, he said, it's Paul here. Said, Paul? Yeah, Paul Messenger. He said, oh, Paul, yeah, how are you doing? And he said, um, I'm missing the loudspeakers and more than that, my wife is missing them very much and we want to buy a pair from you. And I said, uh, are you kidding? He said, yeah, no, we want to buy a pair. And, you know, you know we, 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 we. And I said, well, okay, Paul, I, 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 will, I will arrange for it. And then we discussed the colour and everything and with his wife as well, and what finish they would like. And I, we, we got them made in the factory. And I delivered them personally, of course, and we set them up together. And we had a lovely evening together, a glass of wine and some cheese and listening to lovely music. It was a wonderful evening. But for me, it was like the end of the story because the story had gone full circle. This, this person I'd really idolised as a, as a young guy growing up and trying to get my hi-fi business moving, but it was underfunded and I was coming up with designs which were completely impractical economically to acknowledge it by even buying it. And he actually, I met him again in um, Munich 
in the Hi-Fi show in Munich a couple of years ago, and he said to me, Harley, he said, you know what? He said, that's the first pair of speakers I bought and paid for in 35 years. And uh, we had to laugh. It was, it was, it was lovely. And, um, bless him. And now we've got customers well, actually all over the world who are very happy with our product, and it makes me feel proud. And, and I know that my daughter's happy too. So that's my story. <laughs>